Welcome to the Nerd Party. Ah, oh, Miles here. Your Owl Post for the week is freshly delivered, and I am just one of the hosts here, Matthew Rushing, and with me, as she is every single week, the one and only, Drea Kaufman. Hello! Hey, Drea, how are you? I'm doing well. Pretty tired, but yeah. good. I can't believe we're already, as we're recording this, in August of 2019. It's I know. Ridiculous. All, 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 how fast all this is going is just insane. Yeah. Well, not only that, but I mean, we only have a few chapters left in the Order of the Phoenix, but it felt like everybody was maybe celebrating that because we got a few things that have come in. One was we got a brand new five-star review. Woo! Yeah, it says, after all this time, always five stars. Uh, Mrs. Ward 29 said, bloody brilliant. <laughs> I'll take it. I love I it. I love Straight it. to I, the point. Absolutely. Absolutely. We also got a note from Abby. She emailed us uh, and she said that um, she's been rereading the Harry Potter series and listening to the podcast. Um, and uh, she was listening to our episode 52, Rat, Cat, and Dog. And then this episode, she said that Drea did not want to spoil her theory about Scabbers, saying with the Weasley family, but she'd really like to hear your thoughts, Drea. So. Sounds like um, something that Drea will have to email back unless you feel like it doesn't spoil anything and you could um, you could talk about it now. I don't think it spoils anything now. I'm thinking through my theory to make sure. Um, I, I don't think it spoils anything now because the theory really was that Peter Pettigrew, we find out, is Scours, right? And that... He so the theory being that he lobbed off his finger after he killed all those muggles to make it look like he died as well, um, mm-hmm. and that Sirius was trying to kill him, which we learned in that book. So none of that is kind of a surprise, um, but that he went into hiding after because he didn't want the Dark Lord to think that he had betrayed him and that he was a coward, right. which. In all honesty, he was. So um, the fact that he picked the Weasley family is because they had enough magical ties to know if something was going on. So he got to kind of hide out in a safe place with a safe family where he could keep an ear on the magical community without being obvious. Um, So that was kind of... And that they had ties to the ministry and all that. Like they were just the perfect wizarding family for him to hide from Voldemort with. Um, He wouldn't go to one of the uh, supporters because then they would know and find him. Like this is the Weasleys were the perfect family who had enough insight and information into what's going on in the world, but would have no idea who he was or what an animate, what an animagi was or anything like that. So um, he picked them to stay with like as a, a hiding coward because he's actually afraid of what Voldemort would do if he caught him and found out. So yeah. that was my scabbers theory that I couldn't share at the time. But yeah, I think you're, I think you're right. And uh, it's something that, that she mentioned too. She said, you know, she thought that scabbers, uh, uh, you know, would hide with um, the Weasleys versus Voldemort sympathizers um, because uh, you know, somebody else might also know he's an animagus in, in that, realm and so therefore he's hiding with somebody who is very safe for him and yeah so i i completely agree with you i think that makes um complete sense and so yeah that's i i think you're absolutely right um why he would would hide up um with that family and so plus he had no ties they had no ties to anyone they weren't sympathizers they at the time they didn't really take a stance they were kind of too young to be a part of the original order of the phoenix they didn't have any direct ties to, you know, any of the big families that were involved. Um, and how could he have known that that was what was going to happen? So, mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we also got a, uh, an email from Jordan, uh, and uh, they said um, that they hope they take this as a five-star review. They don't have iTunes, and they listen on Google Podcasts. And so um, they uh, really appreciate our, our show uh, and that they've been listening um, – They've listened to the Harry Potter series more times than they can count. 
Uh, and so they've been listening to us uh, since we've been on book five and listen to us all the time. And they wanted to thank you so much as a fellow Harry Potter addict. So thank you so much, Jordan, for um, emailing us that. That's just really nice to hear. We're, we're glad that we help make your days better. Yeah, for sure. And and for going out of your way, even if you aren't uh, an iTunes user, to, to, to give us that rating. I kind of want to put it up there myself and be like, by proxy. Yeah, yeah, it's it's <laughs> awesome. But um, you can, uh, you know, give us a, a star rating review over there on iTunes, help people find the show. Uh, and of course, like you've seen here, we'll, we'll definitely read out your thoughts. Uh, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts, though. Like Jordan, um, we're not just an Apple podcast. You can find us on um, Google Podcasts. We're on Spotify. We're all over the place. Wherever you get podcasts, just search for Outpost and just make sure you're subscribed. And that way, you get uh, the podcast as soon as it drops. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at Join Nerd Party. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash the nerd party. And if you would like to send us an email like we got there uh, from Jordan, you can do that over on the nerdparty.com slash contact. Choose the show. Choose Outpost. And that comes to Dre and I. So this is Chapter 34, Drea, which is the Department of M- Mysteries. And um, there are, I think, four things we could say that happen in this chapter. One. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, they they mm-hmm. ride Thestrals uh, to the ministry. Two, uh, they get into the ministry. Three, uh, they have to find the right room. And then four, it ends on a cliffhanger. So those are really the things that happen in this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> This chapter is definitely one that is just the whole goal of this chapter is to continue building up this suspense, right? Like nothing terribly notable. It kicks off something terribly notable, but it doesn't actually do anything terribly notable itself. Um, I might argue we also learn about another sort of magical artifact actually two different magical artifacts we we are introduced to them here we don't know what they are yet um but it it is such an interesting situation um starting with your first point where they ride the thestrals to the um ministry one we get an idea of how far hogwarts really is from london and and for these animals they say fly faster than harry's ever flown and he's flown pretty darn fast on a broom um it's still a good distance away um so that really just kind of points to how kind of outside of town hogwarts is really set um and and i really love because we talked a little bit about it at the end of the last episode you and i did um about how what was going to happen when these kids had to fly on these invisible horses and I love that she continues with that thought process. And like three of the six of these kids have no idea what is happening to them. They are literally flying on nothing. Um, and for me, that would be horrifically terrifying. I would do it. But oh my gosh, I would have no idea what's happening to me. Um, so that's kind of such an interesting part that she she makes here. Because it's already pretty challenging for those who can see it, let alone those who cannot. I Yeah, I really love that Ron is like, if I could only see these things. And I love Harry just being like, you better hope it stays invisible. Like, the, yeah, the, you don't you, wish for that. No, you don't want to be able to see these, Ron. Um because the way you see these is is because you watch somebody die. And that's really the last thing that you want in your life. Uh, and so I, I really appreciated that. I, and I appreciated the seriousness with which Harry takes this, you know. And obviously for him it is a little easier because he can see them. Um, but, you know, Harry would long to not be able to see them too. So, um, yeah, the flight there is, 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 like you said, it's long. And by the time they get there, it's really cold because they're flying at night and um, they finally arrive at the ministry and I love them getting into uh, the the uh, welcome elevator the, fu- <laughs> the, the phone booth and how they all cram into yes. one phone booth because they don't want to get separated and you can just imagine them like squished in there on top of each other because tr- they're awkward teenagers right so like they don't really want to touch each other either and it's just it cracks me up well, not only that, but the the you have to tell the ministry why you're there, and it's Ron, 
Harry Potter, Ron Weasley, Hermione Granger, Ginny Weasley, Neville Longbottom, Luna Lovegood. Luna Lovegood. We're here to save someone unless you can do it first. And they give them badges that say Harry Potter rescue mission. <laughs> like- <laughs> I know. It's clearly like automated, which is hilarious, you know, because they go through kind of all the same warnings that he went through when he was there with, you know, Mr. Weasley for his trial. Like, all visitors are, you know, required to stop and have wand inspected. And they're like, yeah, 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 just keep going. <laughs> like, But they're clearly just going through all the normal visitor steps they do. Um, and, and I do love that adding to this whole kind of intense moment and they get there and they get in to the lobby of the ministry, which the last time Harry was there was buzzing with people and hopping and full and going. And when they get there, the only noise is the running of the fountain and there's nobody around. And I love that Harry's like, yeah, that's not a good sign. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And they, they ride the elevator to the department of mysteries and they get out, and there is kind of what Harry experienced in his dream, which is there's this circular room that's black, and it's lit by these, like, blue candles, uh, and it's basically the cover <laughs> from the, the novel in the American yeah. version. Um, and uh, there are these doors, and the door shuts, and all of a sudden, there are all these doors appear around them and kind of, like, spin around, and so they don't know where they've been, And they don't necessarily know where they're going because in the dream, Harry just always knew which door to go through. And so now they have to figure out which door they have to go through here. And um, it's interesting to watch them kind of get through a couple doors. And the first door is this really weird room that doesn't have a lot in it. And but there's an enormous glass tank in the middle of it with like green liquid. And they see these like pearly white objects floating around in it and it turns out that they're brains and they're like what in the world is this room (laughs) yeah um and i love and i I don't remember at what point it might be right after this room when they go back in there they start marking the doors they've already Mm -hmm. been through and that's so smart and even even harry says something like that's a really good thought like good job like so that they don't end up going back through the same door and wasting time um because that that to me is maybe the part that misses a little bit in this book is they they're in a hurry but there doesn't seem to, i don't know i don't seem to get the same sense of urgency that I had in the last chapter where Harry was being almost irrational with how urgent he was trying to move um but, you know, marking the doors because they're in a hurry and they don't want to have to go back and do the same thing twice. Um, and, and that's interesting um, that that's, you know, what they decide to do, especially because you don't actually know that the doors don't change. I mean, there's nothing to say. The doors wouldn't lead yeah. you somewhere else when you open it again. Yeah. Um, but but it's a good I- like, yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah. And it obviously comes from Hermione, you know, so shock, um, shock. Yeah, shocking. Um, But she just deduces that hopefully that would be the case. Like you said, that the doors would still lead to the same place, even though she doesn't Mm -hmm. know that's the case. She's just hoping. And so it's like, this is the best way to let's just mark them and see what happens. Yeah. Well, in the next room they go to uh, has it looks a bit like uh, the room that the Wizard Agamont was in. And yet it's. It's not quite the same. There are they it feels almost like a circular stadium. And down mm-hmm. in the the middle of this is a dais which has a ancient, like utterly ancient looking archway that has a veil in it. And so they kind of like make their way down towards it, and Harry just keeps thinking he's hearing voices coming from beyond the veil and Mm -hmm. so does luna as well and it's really interesting because both luna and harry are really fascinated with this and hermione Neville can also hear the voices yeah and hermione is not she is freaked out by this room and wants to get the heck out of dodge um but i just find it fascinating and it we will learn what this is later um, so we can't Very spoil quickly, it. Very actually. Yeah. Like in the next two or three yeah. chapters, we'll know exactly what it is. But yeah, it's just sort of this cryptic arch 
with this weird veil that makes you kind of uncomfortable when you're looking at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So Hermione makes them get out of that room and um, they're back in, you know, our circular door area and the door that they try next is locked and Harry tries Sirius's knife because Hermione's Alohomora doesn't work and it melts the knife. So, like, guess we're not going in that door, which, you know, makes me wonder what's behind that door. And then so they pick the next door that can open. And actually, this has kind of one of my favorite moments in the chapter and that Harry's trying to kind of hustle them all through the room he's like come on come on come on and he says to, he says something to Ginny like hurry up she's like oh now you're in a hurry you weren't in a hurry when you were creepily staring at that archway and like just the moment where she's like oh now it's all about you it was I thought it was pretty funny I mean in the moment of like everything's so tense she's like oh yeah well and it is kind of like she's staring at this this um there is a bell jar that inside of it, there is a tiny jeweled egg that cracks open and a hummingbird comes out and then gets to the top of the jar and then its feathers fall off and then it gets back in the egg. So it's like this circle of life thing happening for the birth of a, a I hummingbird. Mean, yeah, I mean, I would want to stop there. That's that's whack. <laughs> I'd, I'd want to watch what happens. Absolutely. I mean, you don't you don't see that every day. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> well, and it's interesting to note, like they don't see that every day. I mean, like we don't. I don't. I don't know about you, Matt, but I don't see a hummingbird's life cycle every day Mm-mm, inside a know. glass container. But um, even in the magical world, this is something magical yeah, to them, yep. right? Yeah. Like it's something that they don't expect, which is always really nice that she's able to to use that and be like, "This is so magical that they mm-hmm. don't even realize it exists." And it's amazing to them. So, well, and and I mean, it's it's so interesting. It reminds me of I don't know if you ever seen um, Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow. There's this moment where they walk into a laboratory, and inside a bell jar is a tiny elephant. Like it looks like a you know an African elephant. It's just miniaturized, like the size of mm-hmm. a pop figure. Uh, so. Yeah, that's kind of what they're seeing, like just something that's so out of the ordinary, even for the magical world that they can't, I I would, yeah, I can totally understand that. she's they fascinated stop. and yeah. wants to stop and watch what's happening. But Harry's like, we've got to go because this is where we need to be. So they walk through the next door and they end up in this, you know, the cathedral-like room that has all of these, you know, glowing orbs on shelves, you know, and... um. It's funny because I remember when I first read this book, I kind of thought of this place looking more like a Barnes and Noble. And then the movie obviously changed my perspective. You know, they definitely Mm -hmm. made it look, I think, more like the description. But that was my first thought was that it just looked like a place that had tons of shelves, like a Barnes and Noble kind of place. Like, you know. Yeah, I was I always thought of it like a library. Yeah. yeah. Like like an old library where there's just rows and rows and rows of books and they all kind of ultimately blend Mm -hmm. together and look like the same. You can't really Mm -hmm. tell the difference. Only I pictured them with all the orbs on there. And the movie, I think, makes it more dramatic, grandiose than than it maybe was in my mind. I was Mm -hmm. picturing maybe more like a dusty storage. (laughs) Not been sold the library, but... Thank you. I'm glad I'm not the only one. No, that was what I always went. And then when you get to the movie, they make it this like Mm -hmm. really grand, visual, overwhelming spectacle that Mm -hmm. you're looking at. Yeah. Um, Well, and... And like reading it now, like the idea of like a cathedral, like I think of those old European libraries where there's like the two stories, you know, and they have the the massive amounts of shelves, you know, and it just seems or to like go on forever. like the Library forever. of Congress. Yes, like yes, floors. yes, 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 yeah. exactly. That, yeah. yeah. So um, whatever you picture, they are in this room and, and Harry leads them to where uh, he saw uh, Sirius and they get to that row and he's not there. And they're all looking around and Harry's like, what is going on? And Ron's like, hey, dude, have you have you seen this? Because it's got your name on it. And it's one of those orbs that has Harry Potter's name on it. And and it literally reads this S P T to A P W B D Dark Lord and question mark Harry Potter. Uh so <laughs> Well it doesn't say Harry Potter, but it says question mark. <laughs> 
Harry yeah, Potter. it literally <laughs> says question mark and then Harry Potter. Um, so is this about Harry Potter is what you're thinking of. Um, I also love that that um, we, if you were paying attention at the beginning of the book, you know who APWBD is. Um, mm-hmm. So that would be Albus Percival Wilfrick Brian, Brian Dumbledore. Dumbledore. So, and if you've been paying attention throughout the book, I'm pretty sure that everybody can figure out what SPT means as well. Um, so that yep. character you has should, been... You should be yeah. able to find out who that is too. So Harry's looking at it and and he wants to reach for it and Hermione's like, I don't think you should touch it. But he's like, but it's got my name on it. And they're like, everybody else is like, don't touch it, don't touch it. And Harry's just feeling a little reckless at this point and he grabs it. And then from behind them, they hear somebody say, very good, Potter. Now turn around slowly and give that to me. And that's yeah, where the it's chapter so interesting ends. interesting <laughs> because he takes it. Even though everyone is telling him it's a bad idea, he sort of, this is that moment where, I don't know, we talk about how his character is changing and developing. And this is one of those topics where, like, he is so stubborn about it, like, this is his name. This will teach him something about him and his history. And that's like the one area that he won't budge in, right? Like the more he can learn about his family and where he came from and what his life was like growing up that he doesn't know about, the more blazingly sort of dumb headed he'll be. And I think they were just counting on that because that's exactly what he did. Like he should not have touched it. Um, not knowing what it is or how it works or, you know, anything like that. And, um, you know, he did, and we're going to see here in the next chapter kind of what that does and what that means and, and why that's a f- why that matters. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and when you think about it, what has Harry been experiencing this whole book is this connection with the Dark Lord. Mm-hmm. So when he sees something here that has his name on it connected with Voldemort, immediately, would, I don't know about you, you but I want to touch it. a little bit of caution. I mean, I would want to know. Um and so, I would want to know, but I think I'd be like, I don't know that I should do this. It's a little too coincidental. Yeah. So, I mean, what I love about this chapter is, like we said, you know, there are only a few things that happens, but it truly does leave you on that cliffhanger where you do want to flip the page and get right to the next chapter, which is Beyond the Veil, chapter 35. And unfortunately... I am sorry to tell you, you will have to wait till the next episode where we will talk about that. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Drea, um, a- if anybody wants to catch up with you and maybe talk about what's beyond the veil on Twitter, where that's okay, <laughs> uh, where can people find you? You can find me on Instagram at Drea Kaufman, or you can find me on Twitter at PCF Chick. Um, you know, if you want to come tell me what you think about the theory on, uh, scabbers or you know what the weather is like in august 2019 where you are (laughs) or any of the above yes yes well they definitely should you can also find out myself on instagram letterbox twitter and vero under the name match rushing zero two i'm here on the network doing aggressive negotiations with john mills every week we're talking about a new star wars topic so check that out it's it really is such a fun fun show uh, if you love star wars it really um it's the perfect show for you uh, you can also find me on the trek fm network I'm doing two shows one is called the orb i do that with chris jones we talk about star trek deep space nine i do the general geek show there called the 602 club which drea was just on where we talked about uh stranger things season three so that was a lot of fun i hope you'll check that show out and then last but not least doing cinema stories with my good friend courtney and that is where we talk about films We do that through the lens of faith. Thank you so much, though, for checking your outpost. Mischief managed. Join the revolution. Join the nerd party.